about 30, the about 300 people around the world that they are, they are dealing with with tourism and technology non-stop for the last for the last uh, 30 years, and they are, we are bringing different things. So um, let me go very quickly through some slides, um, and then I'll take questions, uh, and then I'm going to send you some stuff. So Excellent. we'll see how it goes. How do we do this here? I'm not so it's yeah. the, the square next to leave. If you want to click on there, Demetrius, and then upload your presentation. And then I need to find the window. I think that is the window. I'm much more a zoomy person myself. Yeah, I know. It's, it's yeah. definitely more intuitive than Teams. PowerPoint Live, it says. I'm challenged by technology. Yeah, that's something's happening. Right. Hey! That's, it's up now. That's great. You've got. Uh, Floor is yours. Is it in presented mode? Is it is it right? You can see yeah. the right thing. Yeah, yeah you can see that. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, for those of you who do not uh, know me, have not come across. I normally work in Bomb University. I escape thinking that uh, COVID will be much better here, and um, I'll collaborate with colleagues here. But, but in fact, um, the situation is quite it's quite difficult. Um, someone talk about gamification. That's a fantastic book to buy. We just brought that out with case studies from around the world. Uh, we've done it with my colleague Fei Fei Su, who's in China, uh, and we look into how can you actually do gamification in tourism. Very, very specialized kind of uh, book, uh, but gives you all kind of very, very interesting things. By the way, very quickly, Pokemon Go was the closest we've ever come to gamification. And there are a lot of things were happening, but what's very interesting with gamification is how do we influence decision making, and how do we influence what people do? This is what I normally do. I've done the um, the editor in chief of tourism review, and the uh, and I'm just finishing the encyclopedia of tourism management marketing. I've got a lot of different data, and you'll see in a minute one of the very interesting things that's happening. Oh, is that showing all the slides? because I don't want you to see all the 150 slides. It just says tourism at the area of crisis. Yep. I need to... Uh... Okay, because I've got a lot of slides that I don't want you to see. <laughs> because we'll be here for for a few days. <laughs> yeah, we've got till eleven o'clock. <laughs> uh, there's uh, there's a lot of slides about crisis, which I'm now going through, and very quickly, and I'm going into the rainbow. And says after crisis there is a rainbow. Yeah, I very much hope rainbow. That man, I very much hope that the madman in Russia does not press the button because then everything we're saying will be totally irrelevant. Uh, but anyway, let's say that the world is becoming a better place where we can actually do nice things and we will be able to go forward. And the go forward is um, what we call smart and agile tourism that's much more resilient and it enables us to do a whole range of things much better than we did in in the past. Now, um, as soon as I finished with my vaccination, I went to Greece. I uh, was that was in um, in Naxos Island, and you can see the cover of the of the encyclopedia, and you can see uh, the um, uh, God Apollo temple where I had to actually complete that. But one of the things was. Um, that when you are going around, you just realize how reliant we are in tourism. And I, this is a guy who was selling cheese, and this is the first time that governments start realizing what tourism is doing for us. Because up to recently, we had quite a lot of issues. Now, I love Scotland. I've been to Scotland several times, and I'd love to spend a little bit more time when the opportunity arises. But let me remind people that in 2018 and 2019, 
a lot of people didn't like tourism in Scotland and there are issues about over tourism and a lot of other things. And I think we really need to start looking into a little bit more strategically and this coming out of the encyclopedia. So before we go into technology, you really need to understand how all of these things need to operate together in the sense that the tourism system, you've got the, the, the customers on the one side, obviously the destination on the other side, and the transit region. And what we need to do is we really need to uh, have equitable returns on investment for, uh, uh, for the resources that we use. Resources are coming in, outputs are coming out for different people. So we really, before we start talking about technology and everything else, we really need to look into who are our stakeholders and what they need to do and how is this the whole system operates. And then we created the pyramid which says strategy planning and something else I cannot see here. Then you've got the market forces and this is the markets and how the markets are moving forward. And here you've got the exogenous variables, all the different things that have been influencing what tourism is about. And then at the bottom of the pyramid, you've got the infrastructure, you've got the technology. And what happens since um, technology is create the platforms where interconnects everything and everybody in that, in that system. And it's really critical to understand how now we are going into that kind of space, the cloud, where all the information is constantly available and everybody has got information to absolutely everything in real time. Because that creates a range of different disruptions that we find in the tourism industry because a lot of the processes are, are, are changing dramatically because of that. Now, when you start looking towards 2030, you see that we're only uh, eight years away and you see that we've got several uh, sustainable development goals to achieve. And tourism is one of the most critical uh, elements to actually achieve those. But I think what's very important is to understand that we are not going to go back. A lot of people were, uh, I've been talking uh, to a lot of people in the last two or three years and I've been trying to help the industry come forward to the new realities. And the most important thing is to make sure that everybody understands that we are not going back to 2019. We are going forward to 2022, 2023, towards 2030. And that means that we should not look at the mirror. We need to be looking forward to a lot of the things that are happening in the future. And one of the things that's happening in the future is we learn to operate with no planning almost. What we used to do, we, we used to plan things and budget things and everything, and then COVID was changing everything. And, and you had to change all your plans in, 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 in two days. And you had to change all your strategy. All your strategy could be good enough only for two weeks. And I think that will leave a range of different um, impacts in our ecosystem and how we operate in the future. Now, this is the background of, of what we're doing. And I think what we really need to look into is how do we bring what we call smart tourism, agility, and ambient intelligence coming forward to a situation where um, the industry is moving uh, uh, forward dramatically. Because one of the things that happened during this period is we all learned how to operate digitally. People who have never done it before, um, they've done digital uh, banking, shopping online, um, uh, e-health, they've done a whole range of things. So our industry has moved dramatically. Smartness is really not about using technology. Smartness is really about interoperability, interconnectivity of all the players in the marketplace. Smartness is really about how do we operate tourism as a network where everybody is interconnected and we are re-engineering process based on real-time data in order to produce innovative services, products, and procedures towards maximizing the value for all the stakeholders. Critical thing here, all stakeholders, not the customers, not the locals, not the industry, not the tour operators, not the tourist boards, but all of them together. So what smartness is really critical, uh, what smartness is really doing is bringing 
the opportunity to optimize the network. And you remember early on that we talk about the resources that are coming in and, and the value that's coming out. So we really need the entire system to operate in a very clever way. And to do that, we take advantage of uh, the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything, and we interconnect se sensors and beacons. Search sensors are collecting information, and beacons are sending information out. So in order to make decisions, we really need to understand what's happening in real time. Quite often, a lot of the a lot of the information, the data that we get, is actually historical data. It's data that have happened some time ago. And then we're trying to design based on this historical data. Increasingly, what technology and smartness is doing is enabling us to go forward and be agile with real-time data and actually manage by wire. And essentially, it's very similar like a pilot trying to, to, to fly a plane. You've got, you've got the, the basic information, but then a lot of the information is contextual and it's generated in real time. And that's information, some of it is exogenous variable, some of it's our customers, some of, it, some of them are ourselves. Now, smartness is not come on teams. Teams does not want me to go to my next slide. I don't know why. I love teams. Okay. Here you go. So smartness is not about technology. It's not about digitization. It's not about evolution. It's not about social media. It's not about reservation. Smartness is about bringing the entire system and operate in real time, make it dynamic and adaptive, and make it customize to individuals when they arrive. So different customers who are coming to Scotland have got very different needs and they've got very different context. If it rains in Scotland, you've got a very different experience if it's sunshine in Scotland. If you're coming to Scotland with a dog, it's a very different experience if you're coming to Scotland with your girlfriend or with your, with your boyfriend. So all that's about customization, all of, all of that, that is about understanding what's the individual needs and supporting the individual needs. Now, in order to do smartness, you bring people, you bring technology, and you bring leadership. These are the inputs to smartness. And then you need to bring it together the economic actors, the sociocultural actors, and the technological actors to develop smart innovations. It's not only about technology, it's about bring all the different actors to operate to operate together and manage together the resources that we've got. And it's all about bringing the technologies on the basis to create the innovations and then from the innovations to bring that kind of magic moment that we do in tourism when you've got the supply and the, uh, the supply side and the supply chains meeting the customers when the customers are, 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 are meeting us at the destination. And then you've got a whole range of technologies to actually manage this and, and, and operate this at the same time. So effectively what you have is you've got travelers on the one side, you've got the tourism industry on the other side, and you've got um, what we call SOCOMO, social media context-based and mobile marketing, where you're taking advantage of smartphones and you're taking advantage of those um, things that people are carrying them to connect the different dots. And you really take into consideration context, internal context that is related to the traveler and the user, and external context in terms of what's happening on the location, what happens with the weather, social environment, season, time, uh, political situations, traffic, emergencies, delays, air pressure, light, um, uh, pandemic and earthquakes and all kinds of things that are happening. So what, you, what you're trying to optimize is you're trying to optimize the value for these guys by understanding what's happening around them and then what's happening inside them and bring the right kind of thing. 
Now, in order to do that, you need a lot of data. And the data empowers agility for dynamic, volatile, and time-sensitive industries. So a lot of data exists already, but a lot of the data is siloed in different kinds of areas. So for example, uh, if you've got uh, flights that are coming late in Edinburgh or in Glasgow, would the tax drivers know about that and um, delay going to the airport to pick up passengers, or would they have, or, or nobody tells them, or they don't, the network does not, uh, does not get together to understand what's happening. So this is exactly the issues that we need to coordinate the entire industry. And basically, the framework is like this. You've got data that's coming out of the tourism supply. It goes on the cloud in terms of, um, uh, in terms of data. We analyze the data doing data mining, and then that comes down as a storm of value to the consumers. And that comes back as, as, as data back to the tourism supplier. Now, we used to do that for a long time in the tourism industry. We've always done. But this circle used to take a year, minimum. Now this circle is going, is going very fast because what you can do is you can look into the information, change the data, change the process, come back with um, different value, and then you can change many parameters as we are going along. You can change pricing, you can change availability, you can change um, uh, the offering, you can package different things in different ways. Um, so all that can be very, very dynamic. And we need to understand the customers because the customer is not. So when the customers are going through, you've got two types of social conduct. You've got face-to-face -face social conduct as they're going through the, um, uh, the destination. And then you've got online social conduct because consumers have got their smartphones and they are constantly engaging with different players. And they're constantly uh, expressing sentiments or, or asking for information or looking to share information at the same time. We have done a lot of research on this and what we found is we classified um, visitors and travelers in six different types. There are people that they uh, switch off their mobile phone when they go away and they lock it in the, in the, in the hotel uh, lock and there are people that they are constantly engaging by do, taking pictures, um, uploading information, asking for information, engaging with different people. And then the latest thing that we're looking at right now is streaming. It's how people are streaming their own experiences as they're going, as they're going along. <coughs> Perhaps the most interesting thing is the, what we call real time service where we're trying to understand what's happening now in your location. What we're trying to understand is what is the context right now? What, what time is it? Obviously, it's 10.30 in the morning in, uh, in Scotland. Um, what is the temperature? Does it rain? What is the situation? What people are talking about? What, is in, what people are, are, are looking into, into doing? How can you add value to them? And here you've got a situation where by looking to data, you can understand a lot of real-time triggers, but then that creates a situation that we call nowness, which is data-driven understanding customers and providing real-time uh, uh, engagement to actually maximize their value. So what we do is we are looking to the data and constantly understanding what can we do to improve the experience of, of people and engage in this conversation uh, in real time across multiple platforms. And then when you are dealing with crisis, this is the real time response conceptual uh, framework, which is looking to what information do we need to know in order to deal with crisis? And how can we manage the tourism industry in such a way that can man maximize the output and maximize the value and at the same time improve the resilience. So I don't want to spend a lot of time because I would rather have a conversation with you, but ultimately we have what we call ambient, 
uh, intelligence tourism where you've got the Internet of Things and the Internet of Everything. You've got uh, 5G uh, and connectivity. You've got RFID to connect with different things. You've got mobile device and smartphones that they are that they are basically operating as remote controls. Um, you've got apps, you've got cryptocurrency, you've got sensors and beacons, you've got pervasive computing, you've got gamification, and ultimately you've got artificial intelligence and machine learning that uh, is, is looking to the data much faster than human beings and comes up with, with solution different things. Uh, and the next big thing will be robots. And this is, um, Four years ago in Hangzhou, in China, where this little robot was following me, and this is in, uh, now they're getting a little bit nicer. Uh, he is called the Rise, and he goes around and disinfects, disinfects people and places. And this is uh, an interesting one, because this is, um, this is doing, a, a, they call it robot tea. It's creating tea for you and it is serving tea for you and if I, if we were not in i don't know if i can do that let me let me try here you go once we have actually done the tea then it does a little dance to thank you for uh, having uh bought tea from the robot I'll stop here. Um, obviously, this is 35 years worth of uh, research and a lot of publications that I suggest that anybody who is serious about these things uh, you're reading uh, and you you look into how different bits um, connect to, to each other so you can have a strategic approach to what we're doing in, uh, in tourism and technology. And this is how you get in touch with me across different uh, uh, social media and different platforms. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dimitris. Lots of food for thought there. Um, and uh, yes, so I, I, hopefully people have some questions and discussion points if you want to stick those in chat or put your hand up. Uh, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying about um, the smartness being that combination of leadership, ICT and people. Uh, and I just wonder, you know, we obviously this is a destination leaders program for Scottish tourism industry and you were quite rightly saying you, you were a bit concerned about some of the discussions that we were having seem to have been had 30 years ago or whatever uh, you know, what what if you were to say what were the single 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 thing that we could do best here in Scotland in terms of addressing smartness as a destination leaders group of destination leaders what how would we start and where would be the best starting point do you think we have, you never heard about the discussion about Travel Tech Scotland uh, and the initiative to, to, to create this cluster. Uh, and have you got any thoughts and observations on how we might um, you know, sort of steal a march and, and make sure that we are truly um, becoming smart in our approach in Scotland? I think we, one way or another we'll be forced to be smart, otherwise we are not going to survive. Yeah. Uh, so. It's 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 best when people start realizing um, how we can take advantage of things. What's happening normally, and we've seen it in many many destinations around the world. There's a pyramid. There's someone innovators in the beginning in, on the top of the pyramid. You have got 10, 15 percent of the of the population of the pyramid of stakeholders who are very advanced and they are operating quite a lot of things. They're using different technologies. They are connecting. And it's not something that they, they, they're they using different ways of connecting with different stakeholders and they are actually managing uh, uh, their operations. Then you've got a lot of people in the middle that they are the wait and see people. And then you've got a lot of people in the bottom of the pyramid that they have no idea. They just want the, to have a, a bed and breakfast or they are really hospitable kind of people, but they are not necessarily in that kind of space in terms of technology. Um, so the way that I've advised the European uh, Commission and a lot of different people to do these things is by looking to the innovators and get the innovator, uh, innovators to talk to their peers. So nobody is listening to an academic when we're talking to an, a bed and breakfast or a hotelier. And although, you know, I've spent all my, all my life in hotels and bed and breakfast, 
and different places, the minute I say something, they say, oh, but this is too academic for me. But what I'm saying to people is that, look, the highest level of technology that you use right now is WhatsApp. This is the fastest growing technology for hotel management, WhatsApp. It's really low end, but very, very um, effective. So what we need to do is we need to connect the dots, and that's why you need um, leadership from the top to understand how to connect the dots. And then you need to bring the innovators in to showcase how the dots are connected and how they can manage the different kind of uh, challenges and how they create value. And then what happens is that people follow the innovators. And the people on the bottom of the pyramid that they have never innovated, sooner than later, they become so uncompetitive because people cannot find them, they don't have, um, they don't have access to markets and things like that. Now, in our industry, we have a lot of people who are lifestylers. They are not doing it because of the economic benefits. They are doing it because they like a, a particular lifestyle. And they are not very efficient economically. But what you what you have is you have got disruptions like Airbnb. You've got you've got Booking.com taking twenty percent of your margin. So one fifth of your of your money never arrives to you. Yeah. So you've got all kind of situations. Then and then after a while, people say, um, "But this is not sustainable. I do not make money." And then they go into the government and say, "Give me money, because somehow I deserve to be." To, to get money. And the government says, sorry, I need to pay uh, health, I need to pay education, I need to pay. Why should I pay tourism as a private activity? Um, so, and, and this is not obviously, I don't know what's happening in Scotland, I haven't been for four or five years now, but, but it's a global kind of phenomenon. So, unless we improve the game in the tourism industry, other players are going to come in. They'll buy our assets because we're desperate. And then we get out. And that is that is a situation and it's a global phenomenon. Now. So how you do it again, you go with the innovators. And quite often people think that the innovators are the big guys, but that is not right. Innovators is about leadership. In, and leadership can be from very small guys that they understand what we're dealing with and they deliver things all the way to the very big guys. But my experience shows that the big guys are very arrogant and they are very, they've got legacy systems. So if you are, I'm not going to, I'm not going to mention any names here, but if you're a big hotel chain and you've got a lot of legacy systems and directors left, right and center, you don't really want to change. So they are very uh, inflexible in the way that they are adopting technology. Do me a favor, go on any international hotel chain and have a look on their website. It's hygienic. It's so hygienic. It's totally irrelevant, right? So when I'm going to a website, I'm looking for, for some excitement. I'm not looking to tell me I've got a standard room. What's a standard room? And I've got a superior room and a deluxe room. Hello. And then, of course, we are complaining that Airbnb came along and took our market away. Why did they take our market away? Because people put some love into their product, right? They created the platform. They gave 10%. So the price was not very high. And they, they did what we used to do as hoteliers. 20 years ago, some personal touch. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I'll look after you. I can see a lot of people disengaged behind um, behind um, closed cameras. And <laughs> it feels, I think it feels just, lonely in Hong Kong. I think it's maybe just to try and uh, keep the brand with people are you know sort of if you've got your video on it can affect the bandwidth so. Um, I think that's maybe why they switched them off. If you switch them on again now, um, so I think it's a smart thing to switch on cameras. You uh, let's have a, a, a proper discussion here. 
Yeah, <laughs> good. Uh, one of the things, I've got a question coming from Lindsay, but one of the things that we've talked a lot about is, is community-led tourism and regenerative tourism. Uh, and I wonder how that squares with what you were just saying around smartness uh, and how how do you then make that bridge with communities? Um, and, you know, if we're talking about resilience, I mean, the whole, the whole movement around regenerative tourism is very much from the bottom up uh, and, you know, recognising that the expertise lies with people at, at the front line in the communities, uh, but they're maybe not there for as connected with the, the innovators in terms of the use of technology. Have you got any thoughts on that, Demetrius, and how we marry those kind of two movements? Look, from 30, for 30 years of my life, I've been between academia and industry. And I keep, I keep going from one to another just for fun, and I quite like it. And quite a lot of my colleagues, academic colleagues, are coming up with very fancy titles for very, spe for very um, things that uh, would never happen. Okay. So, um, a, lot of the things that, a lot of the things that are coming to the marketplace have got to do with the value and the connection that people are doing. So regenerative tourism is going to happen when you bring tourism to work with the community and you get them to enjoy what the community is doing. So I went back to Bali after 25 years. And I remember what I did in Bali in 94 and what Bali was in 2019. And one of the people were surprised because when they asked me what I'd like to see, so I, I said, I'd like to see this guy who was running this very small restaurant, Varung, on the beach. And I managed to track him down because at that time we had a connection. Think about what connection is Edinburgh offering? What connection is Scotland is offering? You may have connection with individuals but how do you connect and how do you make people part of your culture how do you take me through different things to give me real real experiences right not kind of plastic experiences and 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 i think that is the most important thing for all those things to happen for people to care about you you really need to have invested from the heart, because it's not it's not a plastic thing. I'll create a process. Come and see my come and see my um, backyard. But really engage, and then people are doing the best thing because they come to you and they say, "I'm absolutely connected with you," and I may not be coming every year, but I really care about you. And where smartness is really critical is how do you connect with social media? How do you engage with people? And I'm not talking, a lot of people, a lot of destinations are giving the social media to a marketing agency to do. And a lot of people, you know, um, a lot of hoteliers, they're giving the marketing agency to do their social media. And the marketing people are, are creating two posts and they're counting, they're measuring every time uh, the engagement. But they have no idea what's happening in the property. They have no idea what's happening at the destination. Okay, I'm a little bit um, strange in the way I'm dealing with these things. But but it's really about connecting people. And now we've got so much technology. I remember when I was I was working in hotels in in the 80s. You'll send letters and cards, and they'll arrive three weeks, three months later. Now we're just sending a little message saying, how are you doing? How are you coping? And I know hotels that they, during COVID period, when everybody was on lockdown, or they were going around and say, let me show you Naxos here. This is what we're saying, guys. We're expecting you come back, right? And it takes, it's not about technology. I keep saying that. It's really about agility. It's really about using the tools in a clever way. And the tools are there, and almost all the tools are free. Yeah. There are a lot of things that are out there, but a lot of the tools are free. We never had so so well in the in the past. Yeah, it's a very good point. I think that's the thing. It's always the, the, the whole nature of tourism is about that personal interaction. That's the thing that we crave for most during lockdown. We realised we missed most was that 
engagement with different cultures and different people and, and different experience. So very good point. Uh, Lindsay, would you like to ask your question? Oh, Demetrius, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, it wasn't so much of a question, but more just a, a thank you. Um, Kenneth, you mentioned it at the beginning, but obviously my background is business events and we are working with um, the International Electrotechnical Commission um, to bring this to Edinburgh in 2024. And they are obviously working a lot of um, information on obviously electrics and um, the future is electric and smart cities is part of that. So this is actually just from my personal my experience. They're going to be an event that comes to the city, which is actually going to change the way the city is because their focus is going to be completely on how do we engage Edinburgh council, government level to develop that sort of smart city agenda further and obviously push the, the future is electric message. Um, and I do believe that actually, you know, business events have got that way where they can change a multitude of things, whether it's a medical conference or a scientific conference, they are the people that come together and come up with these um, solutions to the problems in the world. But it's just that this one in particular, I feel quite passionately about because they will probably change the way that we do things in Edinburgh and push us forward. And they're coming to our city and our country. And it's a huge sort of um, coup for us, if you like. But it was just a sort of thank you because it really fed, feeds into all of the stuff that I'm dealing with with them that I have no idea about. So thank you. <laughs> so you're letting us keep it I feel for you because because all the people on events uh, have been almost invisible from COVID and and the governments because they 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 have not, they've seen facilities they've seen buildings but because a lot of the things that you are doing is intangible a lot of a lot of people have actually not seen it now let's go forward and there's something a lot of people are asking me around the world. Are we going to go back and have events like we used to, to do, 2000 doctors medical conference? And I say yes. But equally, I say we're probably going to a very hybrid kind of situation. Where before COVID, I used to travel 200 days per year talking in different places. Now I'm talking much more, but from my computer. I hate it. And especially when people are keeping their cameras closed. I absolutely hate it because there no connection. Plus, there's no wine, there's no cheese, there's no gossip. There's, it's so hygienic, it's so kind of crazy, right? Uh, now, people are going to go back. But remember what I talked about metaverse. We are going to increasingly be living in this kind of schizophrenic situation where you're going to be physical and, and, and digital at the same time. And then do I need to come to Edinburgh to find out what is required to, to do better heart operations? I mean, in reality, I can find it without coming to Edinburgh. And what, because I may not be able to travel, disabilities, I may not have the money, I may have a whole range of things. So I think we're, gonna, we're going to see and we learn through COVID to do all kinds of family relations, love relations, doctor relations, all, all digitally. So we really need to see how we're going to go forward. The other thing that a lot of people do not realize, and most of the tourism industry does not realize, is that the co-creation is not necessarily happening between the service provider and the receiver of the service. It is happening with a range of different players. This is something that we call co-creation. And Ivana, who is in your school, um, used to be my PhD student, and she was doing festivals. Her PhD is about festivals. And we looked into how the impact of one person who goes to a festival is influenced the experience of another. Now, we did that in a physical kind of situation. You can all think about the situation where you went to a restaurant and the table next to you actually improved your experience. I don't know. They had the guitar and they start playing the guitar or they they destroyed your experience because their kids were running up and down and they're screaming and they're throwing meatballs around. All has happened to me. OK, now. This is on a physical kind of situation. 
but now we are going to go to a digital situation at the same time. So the applications already, as you know, that for conferences, how do I meet Kenneth and how do I meet Jane? I'm going to a conference to meet those individuals. And there are technologies that are kind of looking to proximity. Where is Jane? Where are you? How can we kind of get together? Imagine now where we're going to be able to get together physically and digitally at the same time. This is really, really the interesting things. And we really need to look into the innovations on how can we co-create experiences by bringing everybody. I keep talking about everybody coming together, stakeholders all coming together. And what is your role? How do you add value to that situation? Because, because a lot of people have spent all their life creating paper and giving paper. And we, you know, they tag us and we go around conference carrying out our, 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 is that the value that we have? So we really need to rethink a lot of the things that we are doing. And we really need to start understanding what is the customer actually want to. It may be that you look after my dog when I'm going to a conference. And that will be part of the conference package. There are a lot of opportunities there. A lot of people are feeling threatened, but there are a lot of opportunities out there. For if you understand the customer intimately, then your customer is coming out of to you because you understand what they need. And they're willing to pay for it because you actually have got better value to their to their problem. Really interesting. It's a really interesting point. I, I like the point you were saying about the fact that you don't get the wine, you don't get the cheese, you don't get the gossip. Uh, and you know that's that's and fundamentally I think that's what we all miss as humans um, and uh, you know so that hybrids thing is very very interesting that you, know, you still people are craving that coming together and the serendipity of conversations that you have with people when you you come into the same room is just you know it's, and the fact that we're doing the destination leaders program online it's completely different from the experience that Jane and I have had over the last uh, nine years of delivering this face to face and the relationships that people have built and the long-term networks that they've developed has um, been so strong in a face-to-face -face scenario and hopefully we'll see some of that online. There's a question from Zareen. Hi there Demetrius, thank you so much. Um, it was just about the aspect of regenerative tourism. You mentioned that you know there's terms that basically you said can end up being terms that are used but kind of not put into practice really. And I think regenerative tourism is definitely going down that way, unfortunately. But I feel something you said about co-creating experiences is probably one of the keys. And someone that comes from like a, a web a solutions background, I feel like it's co-creation, co-creating experiences for industry seems like a, a long winded is time consuming. And maybe that's like an approach that they're not taking because of that. Um, but how can how how can it be a, a more effective way of getting the community engaged to to create those co exp creating experiences basically? Um, and how have you found communities um, interacting with that? You really need to look into what triggers different people, and quite often it's it's actually it's not their profession; it's their personal interest. So you cannot say that all bakers would like to meet tourists. But I've operated in environments where I had two bakeries of people that they really like to have tourists. And the most expensive tourists I had, you know, when someone comes along and pays 1000 uh, euros for, for a room night, there's nothing I can give them on a breakfast room that they had never had before. Even if I put gold on top of their eggs, they had it before. So what I ended up doing is taking them to the bakery five o'clock in the morning, ask the baker to have one very good tomato, olive oil and feta cheese. And I was taking the most expensive customer to the cheapest possible thing, but it was real. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've ever been in a Greek bakery or any bakery for, the, for, this, uh, for this matter, but when you get the bread out and still very hot and and we we used to give the idiots the tower so they don't break themselves. They don't burn themselves. But the minute that, they, that you break the bread, 
the crack that you feel. That connects you with the community. Now, I used to, I used to pay 50 euros to this baker for the privilege of a loaf of bread, a tomato, a little bit of olive oil, and a feta cheese, and a coffee, right? Because I was taking 1,000, and it was only fair I'll give him 50. But the customer was paying, was getting an experience that was priceless. For everything else, he had Master, Mastercard, you know, it's priceless otherwise, Mastercard, or the, or the Golden American Express, that he could buy anything. But he didn't want the 25 pounds breakfast, uh, Scottish breakfast with whatever you're serving. They just wanted to go into, in to have a real experience. Now, where's technology coming into it? Somehow we need to actually showcase what we've got in our, in our neighborhood. It needs to be, why is it different to be in Glasgow than being in Edinburgh? Ooh, did I say that? Is it different? Okay. Why is that different? Why should I go to Glasgow? Why should I go to Edinburgh? Why should I go to Scotland? And what experience would I have? How do I communicate that? And let's let's face it, not everybody will care about everything, right? So regenerative is gonna happen, but it's not gonna happen for everybody everywhere. I care about 20 places in my life because I've connected with people there and they keep connecting with me. Um, I wish I could care for about 150, but I, my, my broadband is not that broad. Okay, so those 20 people will care about you. What have you done to connect with them? That's the important thing. Thank I you. Just, I, did a, I did a project 20 years ago. It was a European project. Typically, you know, we are kind of... Um, looking into different things but one of the things was it's it was called digital graffiti and i think this is a very innovative kind of thing the idea was that anybody could add any content in any place okay digitally digital graffiti so i can say this is where mom was born and th and that information or I would say there are turtles here that you need to be careful. Or I would say um, this song was created here and here you go on the metaverse and you are kind of seeing, you know, Liverpool kind of thing. This was this was born here. Da, da. So we enable people to live um, on digital and physical. This is what we were doing 15, 20 years ago. Of course, we took the money. Thank you very much. The European Commission said, yes, great. Nothing happened after that. But the, but, but, but the question is, the, the thing is there. When I go around with my mobile, with my smartphone, and eventually we're going to have wearables, so it will be on my glasses, I'll be able to go around Liverpool. And if I, if I choose to do music in Liverpool, I live the true music of Liverpool. Uh, if I choose to do, um, I don't know, um, flowers in Liverpool, I'll, I'll change the narrative and I'll change the storytelling and then I'll do flowers in Liverpool. Now, of course, as a destination and as a place, you really need to know what is your value added? What do you really want to do? I remember 20 years ago, I went to Belfast and everybody was telling me, oh, come along to Northern Ireland. It's, it's very green, it's very nice, very wonderful. And I said, look, guys, I'm not coming from London to Northern Ireland because of your greenery and to play golf. If I want that, I go to Wales. Yeah? And they said, what, what are you here to do? And I said, I'm here to understand the troubles. Can you explain to me what I look at, uh, I watch on my television every day? And initially they said, no way. This is a taboo. We are not going to open that. We we have got two sides and the sides are we are fighting, but we don't want you to see this. We want you to come here and play golf. I said, you are dreaming. I'm not coming here because I've seen what happened last night. Someone killed someone. So I said to them, and it's probably 20 years ago, I was still at the University of Westminster. 
I said to them, look, you really need to start explaining to people what's happening. As a result of that, uh, then the taxi drivers start taking 20 pounds and they will show you around for an hour. And then a little bit down the line, there were little buses that they were going around that both sides respected. And I said, gradually, you really need to, and of course you ended up in a pub and everything was fantastic, but, but you, really, um, you really need to understand what makes you unique and how do you connect and who, with whom do you connect. And the other thing is that we are not going to connect with everybody. You really need to choose who do you like to bring in Scotland, in Glasgow, in Edinburgh, in rural Scotland. Who are the, what are these people that are going to look for and what's the value that you can co-create? No, I so wish I had Ivana here, it's very good. Yeah, but sometimes we've talked a lot about that in terms of that kind of values, what are the values of the, the visitors and, and how do they match with the values of our communities? That's, we've had a lot of discussion about that in this programme. Other questions? There's another question there. I think there's something in the chat. Is that you, Jane? Or question about dark tourism, which is obviously Northern Ireland. It was interesting. I did take a learning journey. Well, I was Northern just Ireland. saying, obviously, that's a good example of dark tourism, going to Northern Ireland to see the troubles. And again, it's like... Um, you know, building on experiences. You know, that's what people want to see. They don't. They don't want to see something they can see anywhere else in the world. They want to see something that's unique to that destination. And whether that's a history that's, you know, not a positive one. You know, these are the sort of things that tourists want to do. So. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was in Cambodia two years ago, and it was the same. You couldn't ignore the killing fields in Cambodia. You had to acknowledge it when you were there and try and understand it. Um, and you know. I'd certainly when I was in Cambodia, I went to a few of the sites, uh, the killing fields. It's interesting, in, in Northern Ireland, I've got a fantastic exhibition now in the Museum of Ulster in Belfast, which is about the, the troubles and the reconciliation. And it's so well done in terms of explaining the different day uh, aspects. And so they have embraced that. So it's interesting what you're saying, Demetrius. Any other questions for Demetrius? Uh, I've got a comment just, uh, that Demetrius is just actually... Just hold on, Jane. Yeah. Jane, before you go, um, just on the encyclopedia, we've got an entry about Chernobyl. All right, yeah, yeah. Because just before um, everything happened, Chernobyl was the fastest growing tourist attraction in, in Europe. It was really, a lot of people were really wanting to go and see what was happening and the tragic events now. Uh, but but it's really, I mean, people are going to the most weird things because they've got some interest and they would like through tourism to actually learn and engage with what they're doing. Sorry, I interrupted you, Jane, but just continue. I was just going to say that it's very interesting that you're, I, I read that you're also organizing a Greek gastronomy uh, festival in Hong Kong. <laughs> of course, of course I, I arrived here and they had... There's nothing Greek around here. There's a very small Greek community. So um, I kind of um, grabbed a few things, stole a couple of resources, called some friends, and we organized a, a gastronomy festival. We did a conference online. We couldn't do it face to face. Oh, yeah. And I've got, I've got 120 bottles of wine, 480 beers uh, that have arrived from Greece, cheese, uh, cheese olive oil, and yogurt that is waiting to be eaten, but the bloody COVID is kind of killing us here. <laughs> okay, Guys, by the way, please, please go to Greece on holidays. We need your money. Uh, no, we need you. <laughs> <laughs> I think Paula had a question. Paula, yeah, Paula, Paula question? this is the last yeah. question, and we we'll have to break for a coffee break before we move on to our next speaker. So, Paula, your floor is yours. Yeah, I, I did lower it because I get I was just conscious of time, but I guess it was just to get Dimitri's opinion on, um, I guess the kind of outpouring of love through the Airbnb network for Ukraine, because I think that just demonstrates how people are, I guess consumers are really dedicated to being able to be linked to communities in times of trouble. So I'd wondered if he had thought about that and and what that means for other events that might happen in the future. Good, good I mean, point. This is a, no, that's excellent. Thank you, Paula, for keeping your camera throughout. You were my point of reference to see if I was doing a good job or a bad job. 
because you know colleagues they, they may have heard me before but you were kind of my barometer um this is yes, I'm my uh, favorite speaker for the entire course thank you uh, this is regenerative um, tourism as we speak because people found one way of sending money over and help in in their small or big way whatever they were trying to do um and and you know, actually, a lot of people don't like Airbnb. There's a huge issue about Airbnb, and I've written a paper about the dark side of the sharing economy. But in reality, what you see is Airbnb has got a very bright side, which is grassroots tourism and, and bringing individuals and, and bringing um, small players in, into this uh, ecosystem and take advantage of that. Because, and, and, Airbnb has been very critical in re-innovating a lot of the old grandmother's houses in different places that there are no resources, and that actually created a lot of things. Um, it's a very, very interesting thing about Airbnb. We've done the analysis on Barcelona because they're they are down the line. But, uh, but this, is, this example is really regenerative, regenerative tourism. It's kind of um, without the tourism element, actually, it's regenerative full stop. Uh, but but I guess let's hope that that the situation uh, is is uh, normalized, and let's hope that that um, the war and all the crimes and everything and the killings are stopping. Uh, I think a lot of people will go back, and I think I think I'll make a political statement here. I think the Ukrainians, um, you know, they've they've had such a strong defense and has got so much admiration from around the world that 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 people will go to support them um, at the first opportunity and I, and I and 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 I feel that you know many of us that we didn't know enough about Ukraine will will go back and do that um, 20 years ago I was part of the team that was creating the strategic marketing uh, for tourism strategy for Crimea uh, and it was very, very interesting times to see all the challenges, to see who were the players, to see what was legitimate and what was not, and kind of operate in a very, very, I've never operated in such a complex kind of environment. Luckily, I had a very good translator with me who was, who was translating to me, not what she was told, but she was trans translating to me what I needed to know. And, and that kind of had a huge uh, impact. And, and I feel for Ukraine. I, I really want to go back to Yalta and different places. Up to the point I went, everybody could go to the table that they signed the, Yaltas, the Yalta um, uh, declaration. The, you could go up to, up to the time I went. Everybody could go, sit down on this table and write whatever or have a coffee. Nobody has actually preserve that as a, as a treasure, as something that, that, that needs to be off limits. And, you know, we did a lot of things uh, to actually uh, build their tourism. Thank you, Dimitris, and that's a very a good point to finish on, and uh, we all share your sentiment and hope for uh, an early resolution to the conflict in, in Ukraine and for peace. Um, so it's just such a worrying time, as you say, in terms of where it might go next and just Fingers crossed it goes the other way uh, in their success and, and the two sides come into some sort of agreement. So thank you very much for your time, Dimitros. Very much appreciated. Uh, it's time for you to go and get some nice food in Hong Kong. Enjoy your dinner <laughs> and good luck with the Greek festival. Uh, very much enjoy your candidness and your openness uh, and very, not, very much not a kind of academic approach, very much rooted in practice, which is brilliant. So have a good evening. Thanks again for your support. Much appreciated. And hope to yes. see you face to face sometime to share. Probably you. Yeah, yes. hope face, you face to face sometime for a glass of wine or a glass of beer. So thank you, Demetrius, and good luck in Hong Kong with the COVID. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye. Okay, we're going to take a short break. We, ha we have um, John Carlos from uh, Valencia next, and I see he's in the room. Um, so we'll just take a, a five minute break, hopefully comfort stop and be back at quarter past because I'm conscious of John Carlos's time and he's uh, giving up today. So if you just take five minutes, we'll see you back here at quarter past uh, time to go and hopefully get kettle boiled and a comfort stop. See you shortly.